Welcome back to Simplifying Synthesis. In this video, we are going to look at irreversible inhibitors of botulinum neurotoxin A. This work was published by the Janda Group in RCS MedChem in their paper Irreversible Inhibition of Bond A Protease Proximity Driven Reactivity Contingent Upon a Bifunctional Approach. The botulinum neurotoxins that this paper is targeting are produced by a pathogenic gram-positive bacteria, Clostridium botulinum. So far, we have identified seven different serotypes of bonds, and serotypes A, B, E and F cause botulism in humans. Bond A is the most common and most toxic of these neurotoxins, with an LD50 of 2 nanograms per kilo, and also a half-life of several months once internalized in the neurons. Because of this toxicity, the ease with which it can be produced and disseminated, together with the fact that there is no effective cure for botulism, the CDC has classified it as a tier 1 bioterrorism agent, alongside infectious agents such as smallpox, the plague and anthrax. Botulism is caused by the bond neurotoxin first binding to receptors on the surface of the neuron, which triggers the internalization of the protein into the cell through endocytosis. Once there, the heavy chain and the light chain are cleaved apart and the light chain, which contains the zinc endopeptidase unit, then goes on to cleave the SNAP25 protein. It is this SNAP25 cleavage that triggers the downstream effects, which ultimately can lead to paralysis or even death. The extremely high potency of these toxins is due to their unusual binding mode, which is mediated by the simultaneous binding to two different core receptors on the cell surface. One of these is the protein synaptotagmin, which has a transmembrane loop, the other receptor is a ganglioside, which is a glycolipid that is embedded in the cell membrane. This ganglioside can be thought of as two separate units. The hydrophobic side consists of a ceramide subunit, which has two fatty chains which are embedded into the cell membrane. The hydrophilic end of the ceramide consists of an oligosaccharide. This is comprised of three sialic acid units, two galactose units, an N-acetylgalactose, and a glucose, which is attached to the ceramide. It is this oligosaccharide that binds the bond neurotoxin primarily through hydrogen bonding interactions with the sugar hydroxyl groups. The synaptotagmin protein, however, primarily bonds through hydrophobic and pi pi stacking interactions between tryptophan and phenylalanine subunits. Once the neurotoxin is inside the cell and the light chain is cleaved from the heavy chain, it can act as an endopeptidase. In the botulism neurotoxins, this is catalyzed by a zinc atom contained within the active site. The zinc atom is in a distorted tetrahedral geometry and is coordinated by glutamate and two histidine units. The fourth coordination site is occupied by water. This zinc atom coordinates to an amide within the SNAP25 protein, making it more electrophilic, and this delivers the coordinated water molecule, which is further activated by another glutamate residue and promotes the hydrolysis of the SNAP25 protein. Ultimately, this is what leads to the toxic effects seen in patients with botulism. In previous work, 2,4-dichlorosinimic hydroxamic acid, or DCHA for short, was shown to inhibit the cleavage of SNAP25 by coordinating to the zinc atom and preventing it from catalyzing the hydrolysis of the protein. This showed very strong inhibition in vitro, however the in vivo studies showed only moderate activity due to reversible binding to bond A. Other studies have shown that cysteine 165 can be covalently modified using 2 amino ethyl methane thiosulfonate. This covalent modification leads to the hypothesis that these two effects could be combined into one drug. This strategy would use metal coordination to deliver an electrophilic warhead to cysteine 165 that would covalently attach the molecule to the protein, thereby permanently modifying it, preventing the reversible effects observed with DCHA. In order to analyze the inhibition of these new compounds, the researchers used a FRET based assay. This allows them to quantify the cleavage of a probe molecule called Snaptide, which resembles the SNAP25 protein. This probe has two different chromophores attached a fluorescein based moiety, shown here in blue, and also a chromophore containing two aromatic rings joined by an azo bridge. When the fluorescein molecule is excited, with light at a specific wavelength, it will fluoresce, 
causing it to emit light at a different wavelength. However, when this is in close proximity to the azochromophore, a phenomenon known as Forster Resonance Energy Transfer, or FRESH for short, can occur. Rather than the emitted fluorescence light being observed, this is absorbed by the azochromophore and the fluorescence is quenched. When the snap type probe is cleaved by the Bont A light chain, these two chromophores are separated and FRESH is no longer possible. This allows for the Bont A peptidase activity to be monitored. Using this assay, the researchers screened a number of potential inhibitors. This included a number of acrylamides, which are known for their selective and proximity-driven reactivity with biological nucleophiles. They also investigated a number of alkynes, phenyl carbamates, and a nitrile. The inhibition of the carbamates, however, was not determined, as these showed issues with solubility. Using the FRET assay, they identified some acrylamides and alkynes that showed inhibition, although this inhibition was not potent, with little activity seen at a concentration of 25 micromoles. This led them to investigate a second series of compounds, this time containing more reactive electrophiles, such as alpha haloamides, epoxides, and an aldehyde. These compounds showed more promise, and the compounds containing the alpha bromoamide and the epoxide gave the researchers an insight into what the optimal chain length between the metal binding unit and the electrophilic warhead would be. Using this data, they then designed a final series of compounds and investigated their time-dependent inhibition of Bont A. These included two alpha iodo compounds with a spacer length of 3 and 4 carbons, malamides, also with spacers of 3 and 4 carbons, and an epoxide with a chain length of 5 carbons. These were compared to a compound containing a methane thiosulfonate electrophile. This had previously been reported by Lynn et al. and showed good activity in vitro, however this inhibition was not observed in vivo. These compounds showed much better inhibition than the previous libraries, and also a very fast reaction with the neurotoxin, with the inhibition seen within several minutes of administration. The researchers studied this reactivity kinetics further, by reacting selected compounds with glutathione. This is an endogenous compound that possesses a nucleophilic thiol that mimics the cysteine residue within the Bont active site. These studies found that the methane thiosulfonate compound reported by Lynn reacted too fast for them to measure, while dimethyl fumarate, which was chosen as a positive control, showed a half-life with glutathione of about 12 minutes. The alpha iodoamide compound which was expected to be the most electrophilic, showed a similar time, while the malamide had a half-life of almost five hours, and glutathione, in the presence of the epoxide compound, had a half-life of almost six hours. These reaction kinetics were then studied in the neurotoxin, and the results correlated quite well, with the iodide showing the strongest inhibition after five hours, and the epoxide showing the least inhibition. In order to confirm that this inhibition was due to covalent linkage of the compounds to the neurotoxin. They carried out irreversible dialysis on the samples taken at one hour after incubation. This dialysis removes any compounds that aren't covalently linked to the neurotoxin, and these studies showed almost identical results for the samples before and after dialysis. However, in the DCHA sample, a large difference can be seen, as this compound is a reversible inhibitor and is removed by dialysis, allowing for the activity of Bont A to be restored. To further prove the importance of the dual binding mode, the researchers generated two further series of compounds. In the first series, the compounds lacked the metal binding motif, containing an amide in place of the hydroxyamide, but still possessing identical electrophilic warheads. In the second series, the compounds contained the metal binding unit, but the side chains were modified to lack the electrophiles necessary to form the covalent bond. All of these compounds showed a significant reduction in the inhibition of bond A and confirmed that the metal binding unit and the electrophilic warhead are both essential to the high inhibition seen with these compounds. In order to get a better idea of how these compounds might work in the body, they next studied the bond A inhibition from human-derived pluripotent stem cells. They used Western blot analysis to quantify the amount of SNAP25 protein and the cleavage product, which is formed by the Bont A endopeptidase. 
The intensity of the top band in these blots corresponds to the amount of SNAP25 protein, while the lower band is the cleavage product. In the negative control sample shown on the far right, we can see that there is no cleavage product present, as no bond A was administered to this sample. For compounds 30 and 32, we can see complete inhibition of bond A at 100 micromolar and a dose dependent decrease in inhibition as lower amounts of compounds are added. Compound 36, on the other hand, showed much less activity in these cells. Even at the high dosage of 100 micromoles, it showed very little inhibition of the bond A endopeptidase, contrary to what was suggested by previous studies. Because of this unusual result, the researchers repeated these assays using cell lysate instead of whole cells, and in these experiments they could see bond A inhibition. They suggest that this difference in activity is due to the cell permeability of the compound, which indicates that it does not make its way into the cell, and therefore cannot act on bond A once it has been internalized into the neuron. With the efficacy of these compounds now established, the researchers looked at the toxicity of the compounds. They did this by administering the compounds to HEC293 cells, which is a cell line derived from human embryonic kidney cells. This showed that compounds 30 and 32, which were shown to be more reactive, also show a greater toxicity towards these cells, while compound 36 is much better tolerated. This is likely because it doesn't react with other nucleophiles present in the cell, and is therefore more selective for the bond A endopeptidase. This difference in reactivity was also observed in the stability studies. In these experiments, the cells were incubated in human serum, and their concentration was determined over time. Compounds 30 and 32 degraded quite quickly as they are very reactive and likely form covalent bonds with other proteins present in the serum. Compound 36, however, did show degradation over time, but at a much slower rate than the other compounds. Taken together, these studies suggest that there is a very delicate balance between the desired reactivity with the bond peptidase and undesired reactivity causing cell death and compound degradation. So with the biological analysis taken care of, Let's look at the synthesis of one of these compounds. The synthesis started with the alkylation of a tetrahydropyran-protected hydroxyl amine. This installed the carbon linker with an alkene at the end, which can be transformed into the desired electrophile. In order to couple this with DCHA, they used peptide coupling methodology using HATU as the coupling reagent. The acid is first deprotonated by Hunix base, and this then attacks HATU forming an isouronium salt. This is then displaced by the hydroxyazobenzotriazole, eliminating tetramethylurea. This activated ester is then attacked by the amine to complete the formation of the amide bond. To remove the THP protecting group, they reacted it with PTSA in ethanol. This protonates the acetal and promotes the elimination of the N-hydroxyl group. The oxonium formed by this reaction then reacts with ethanol which was used as a solvent. In the final step, they installed an epoxide using MCPBA. This undergoes concerted addition to the alkene, where the alkene abstracts an oxygen atom from the peroxide, which eliminates metachlorobenzoic acid, together with the production of the target compound. Well, that's everything for this week. In the next video, we will look at the total synthesis of cochlearol B.